need to welcome the first virtual edition of the SEPS IDs Lab. SEPS IDs Lab, which was started about eight years ago, and which until last year we had all in person meetings. And of course, we know that we all have switched now to virtual meetings. But nonetheless, uh, even if it's virtual, the, the policy here in Brussels all around the globe has moved on. And there's a lot which has changed over this last year. Our last edition was in March last year, just before the lockdown started in Belgium. And of course, what we've seen over the last year is a big change in policy, policy priorities, which we intend to discuss over the coming five days here during this virtual sessions. This is the first opening virtual session, which is also um, broadcasted right away, let's say, via YouTube. So you can also look at it through YouTube. To the different listeners, I would uh, like to welcome you and say there is a Q&A box to the left, which you can use. Uh, you see on your ribbon on the left, you see a box with a question mark in it. Let's say there you can leave questions and I will try to raise it to the different participants. Uh, we are still waiting to, for one of our speakers, Esther de Lange from the European Parliament, uh, Vice President of the EPP. Um, I'm just waiting a few more minutes, but um, if not, she will, I think, join every moment because she tried to join a moment ago, but has left again. I don't know for what reason. The Health Union, of course, probably deserves no introduction. I mean, everybody knows what it is about. Uh, but on the other hand, what a health union is at European level is probably a bit more problematic. I've just published with a colleague an article about, uh, under the title, a health union requires more a better definition and requires more discussion, saying that, as we know, health is a national or a local competence in the EU, that if the EU, which is advancing now, I would say at almost stellar speed in the domain of health, that there is a need for more definition, clearer data about what we're speaking, comparable data. I think something um, Andrea will know very well, the difficulty of having comparable data, but also that we need to have more discussion. I mean, for many of you listening in, let's say you may not know, but we're discussing several things in the European Parliament, and that's why I want to have also Esther de Lange involved. We're discussing an upgrade of the ECDC, the European Centre for Disease Control, we're discussing an upgrade, meaning an amendment to the regulation of the EMA, European Medicines Agency. We're discussing a new agency, which is called HERA, the Health Emergency Response Authority, HERA, on which the consultation was just closed on the 12th of May, and on which we expect a proposal by the end of the year. There is also a modified regulation of 2013, which defines the reasons or the circumstances in which the EU can intervene in health emergencies. And there are certainly many other things. This morning, we had another more working session for SEPS members about the role of EMI, of what is called EHI, which is the European Initiative for uh, Innovative Medicines, which is operational since about 10 years, which is co-funding work with the private sector into vaccines, and which will now be called from 2024 onwards EHI, the European Health Innovative Health Initiative, uh, which has a budget of the EU budget of about two and a half billion, which is spread over several years, but has also to the amount of one billion co-funded research into vaccines. Of course, there are also in the new EU budget, there is also an other regulation, by the way, which was adopted just by the end of March, which is the EU for Health, which is a budgetary program to help member states health infrastructures, which is more for public infrastructure for health. There are also other ways by which the EU can co-fund research into um, healthcare, biotech, which can be done through instruments which the European Investment Bank has or the European Investment Fund. Uh, this is a matter of introduction, but anyway, we will try to probably during the session have a bit more closer discussion so, about what health. I and kindly ask those of you who um, register your presence with the QR code to do so before we start meeting and before the QR code disappears from your monitors. But we're already speaking, so we have already started. And I see that Esther de Lange has just joined us, at least on the notes on my screen, but I haven't seen her yet on the screen. I think she will be there every moment. 
So as I said, we have, I think, three excellent speakers for this panel. We have the head of the one of the key agencies, the ECDC, and probably Andrea as a reminder for you in the previous. Welcome. Um, and I'm glad um, that we can continue the work that we have been doing on a regular basis in IPCR. And you have and there's somebody speaking on the session who is now on mute. Friday. And as you know, this is um, our uh, first meeting after the European Council on the... There's somebody else speaking on this session and I cannot exclude it at the moment. moment. Fanny, can you look into this? Okay, I think we will try to continue. So I suggested, uh, Andrea, we are happy that you can join us. But in the previous session, we were discussing the public-private partnership in the uh, medical sector, and somebody said that ECDC has been dramatically understaffed and underfunded for years. So probably with the new regulation, which is adopted or which will be adopted soon by the European Parliament and by the EU Council, we can see a change in the role of the ECDC. We can speak about this in a moment. And Esther, thank you for joining us. We have just started, and I said, let's say that we'll first have Andrea speaking about about for seven to ten minutes about how she sees her role and the role for the future for the ECDC. And then we turn to you to speak about what is all on the agenda of the EU in the domain of EU health. And then we'll turn to Suri. So we start with Andrea. Andrea, you need to unmute yourself <laughs> again. No. Can you try again? Hi. Ah, voila. There yeah. you go. Okay. So, um, uh, thank you very much for the uh, and uh, good afternoon uh, to uh, my fellow speakers and to the audience. Um, yeah, uh, the pandemic has brought a lot of changes and. Uh, oh, uh, will maybe also bring changes uh, for the time after. One of these changes we discuss, the potential changes we discuss now, uh, which um, are the um, uh, legal proposals that the Commission made for the mandate of the ECDC. The EMA. I'm sorry, Andrea, but we we're hearing actually another audio feed into your on your side. Here it's again, completely like quiet. To thank the Commission, ECDC, and the EAS for their valuable. We can, it's like there's another meeting happening, but I, I believe it's coming on your side. If I can ask all the speakers to mute themselves, everybody in the audience that can put on the sound. So, yes, Germany, have a floor. Funny, it's like a translator which is interfering. Indeed, yeah. It sounds like there's a, I think they're just. I don't know if there are like two different uh, audio channels Yes. You tell me when I can continue. Germany will intervene. I guess you, you can, uh, yeah, there's still a, a second audio feed in your, on your side. I mean, it's definitely not coming from this room here. Okay. But if, if you can speak very close to your microphone and loud enough. Okay, is this better? Typical Portuguese, as you can imagine. I think uh, I can't get, get any much nothing, closer nothing, to it. No, anyway, so the, Hello. Uh, so the, 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 the um, legal proposals. Um, I mean, I will concentrate obviously on the um, uh, on the ECDC proposal. But uh, in uh, in essence, what these proposals try is to um, put the lessons that we have seen in the past one and a half years into legal into legal. Um, suggestions and um, I mean right now these uh, proposals are under uh, discussion and debate in the European Parliament and I guess um, uh, Esther will be um, uh, saying more about this I have been uh, for several times uh, in uh, for, for sessions uh, with the colleagues uh, in the Parliament but also in the Council and I have also been sometimes there so from our side uh, this uh, legal proposal are welcomed because they so address uh, the, the uh, issues that we have faced. Um, 
um, the um, mandate of the ECDC as proposed will largely remain uh, uh, a focus on risk assessment and um, um, yes, and um, uh, um, communicable please. diseases. But what will be new is that uh, it's so proposed that we can issue non-binding recommendations. My so far, we just can give options for response. Uh, the, uh, device, and that we also uh, monitor indicators the, uh, that um, are uh, then, giving an uh, um, again, idea we'll, uh, on the capacity uh, of the health system. Overall, the, uh, it's mainly the area Next of slide, surveillance, uh, preparedness, um, uh, laboratory um, so, uh, uh, capacity this, uh, and international cooperation a, that are a largely, largely so addressed. This data from so when we look at, I can go into more details uh, uh, in, the, in the discussion, would, uh, um, but uh, when we look into in the surveillance, the, what we have seen EU is, and Karel has mentioned this in the introduction, uh, that uh, um, the data um, that we have received are um, sometimes not comparable some between member be states. Nonetheless, uh, comparisons um, are partly also with um, quite uh, massive consequences. Uh, travel uh, uh, on uh, uh, mainly based so, on travel. Um, uh, the but then picture. also there was an issue um, with the timeliness the of the data um, and the effort that uh, along the whole chain of surveillance has to be put in by those experts that are actually now also needed for contact tracing, case finding, and so forth. So uh, in the end, the conclusion is that uh, more digitalized uh, surveillance systems will um, help addressing some of these issues. Um, now, uh, that is, of course, uh, a major endeavor. This will not happen in a year or so, uh, that, uh, but it, we have to start at one point. So um, part of this is then also that it should be complemented by modeling and forecasting. That was the other capacity where there were uh, some shortcomings also from our side because we didn't have the, 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 the capacity here. Um, then the uh, other big area of improvement is preparedness. And here the, uh, the uh, proposal foresee that uh, ECDC should uh, strengthen the support to the countries. So no, we... Off. Wait a moment, Andrea, your microphone is off and I don't know why. Screen from here. Andrea, your microphone is off. No, it's working. We can hear her. Yeah. So, is it better now? We can hear you, yeah. Uh, Karel, I think you are the only one that can't hear me. <laughs> Sorry for that. Okay, yeah, I continue. Yeah, okay. So, preparedness. So, we should support the countries more. Uh, and for that, uh, a, a EU health task force has been uh, proposed that would support the countries uh, in strengthening their preparedness, but then also um, as uh, direct support during the crisis. And that uh, health task force also should be deployed or could be deployed to countries outside of the EU. You because sometimes uh, that is um, uh, uh, as, as necessary as uh, uh, helping the countries in the EU. The other part is that indicators, meaningful indicators of the state of preparedness need to be developed that allow us to assess how prepared a country is because um, we were uh, not really in a position to, 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 to assess that. Um, so we should also develop a plan for the EU where the national preparedness plans could uh, could be um, uh, complement. Uh, I mean, uh, sort of linked to. Um, we should support the countries in after action report and uh, help then the countries to support uh, to to fill the the gaps uh, that uh, come out of these act after action reports. From my personal um, uh, experience, there are four areas of preparedness that really need to be addressed. That is hospital preparedness. It is cross border collaboration. 
uh, between EU countries, but also between EU and uh, uh, non-EU neighboring countries, uh, the local preparedness, because this is where the pandemic or any crisis first hits. And lastly, uh, skills and capacity in community engagement. We have seen that the public is so important in supporting and, and helping with the control efforts. And for that, they need to know why they have to undergo all these measures and also be empowered to feel that this is their contribution to the control effort. Uh, the um, laboratory uh, capacity should be strengthened with EU reference laboratory would help in all this validation of the new tests. I mean, uh, we have seen uh, there were tests thrown on the market and there was no EU-wide possibility to actually do the validation. Each country had to do this for themselves. Um, uh, so that is the one thing. And the other part is also the global collaboration. Uh, I think it showed, um, uh, the pandemic showed and shows still that it is absolutely necessary uh, to not only cooperate within the EU, but around the globe. Um, we are trying to do this, but with the proposal, we get some uh, uh, really uh, also more, man more, more explicit mandate. So I can go into any depth that you would like yeah, me to, but I have a few sort of concluding messages. Uh, one is uh, that um, we need to learn the lessons this time. We have done lessons learned after all the crisis in the past years, but we didn't seem to learn the lessons. Now, this time we have to. Uh, we also have recognized that we are globally much more connected than we even thought. And in terms of the infectious diseases, nothing is remote. I mean, everything uh, that happens somewhere in the globe can be in Europe in is actually no time. We have seen how difficult it sometimes was to find common solutions for the EU, uh, but um, we also have seen that for some elements and aspects, even global solutions need, uh, need to be found, and that uh, has uh, uh, its own challenges. We're paying the price a bit that um, we have disinvested in public health in the past years. And I think we should really be very clear that strengthening public health is an investment and not a cost. Um, and lastly, I think no country uh, can uh, cope with a, a, a crisis of this dimension on its own, not even a region. Uh, so we all have to work together and only if we all are prepared, we're all safe. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. I'm sorry for these problems in the beginning, but um, I heard your message and your message was very clear. and. Somebody was asking again this morning in the shorter um, discussion which we had with Imi uh, whether you would have the means to prepare for other variants of um, or other diseases emerging, other infectious diseases. And I mean, if they said, let's say that with a staff of about 270 people, if I remember correctly, let's say that you cannot do this. And if I hear you explaining what the task is already is to follow, say, 27 countries plus what is happening in the neighborhood, this is already enormous. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, there are um, uh, 73 new positions foreseen, which is uh, sounding enormous. But when you, on the other um, hand, uh, see what the tasks are, then um, it will be tight. Which can bring us probably directly to Esther. Esther, which is in the Environmental Committee and the European Parliament, Envy Committee, which is also dealing with public health issues, uh, which is dealing with these proposals to upgrade the regulation about EMA, ECDC, also regarding HERA, and so on. So Esther is also a vice president of the EPP, the group, which is still the biggest one in the European Parliament. So Esther, how do you look at it from your perspective? And of course, you can bring in some views from the Netherlands as well, because it's a big issue of debate in the Netherlands, continues to be a big issue of debate in the Netherlands, and you're representing a Dutch jurisdiction in the European Parliament. Esther. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Karel. And, and maybe, I mean, um, let me give you some very uh, personal experience with this health crisis. I mean, when um, COVID broke in Europe, um, one of the outbreaks, one of the big outbreaks was in the far west of Germany. 
uh, a region in Ottawa and Westphalen bordering the Netherlands. And uh, my grandmother, who was 98 at the time, was in an uh, old people's home in Limburg, in uh, the Netherlands, but this is three kilometers away, literally, from Germany. And um, the, the story in the Netherlands at that time was, for the moment, there's nothing to worry about because COVID, you know, is not in the Netherlands yet. And then you see these very vulnerable, very old people, extremely close to an outbreak, which happens to be just across the border, um, you know, and I always have to think about that when I heard Andrea also say we need these cross-border preparedness plans within the context of this health union. So this makes it for me a very personal story because it's, of course, frustrating to see that every capital thinks until the border and stops there, uh, which is actually the opposite of what the virus does. Um, and, and we should really change our um, um, methods of operating there. But I would like to take maybe a step back and, you know, the title of this event is about uh, a health union. And it, um, despite the fact that we have been a union, a European union since 1993, when the Maastricht Treaty entered into force, I noticed that in the political debate, already using this word union creates uh, unease. At, at two levels or among two different groups, I would say, in this political discussion. First, you have the group that see this word union as a threat to national competences. They would like to keep everything as it is. You know, the description that I gave, think until the border, and that is uh, enough. We see this, for example, uh, in the discussion about uh, the extension of the mandate of ECDC, where the rapporteur has a much more national view uh, compared to many of the other political groups who would um, like to approach this, and my political group obvious, obviously belongs to that uh, uh, group uh, within the parliament that really wants to have a, a global and a European approach to this issue. And then secondly, I think there are those, and I count myself to this uh, group, who are a bit at unease about the word union because they worry that calling something a union doesn't make it a union yet. In other words, they are worried about the huge um, expectations, capabilities gap. You know, this famous concept that was uh, brought forward by uh, Christopher Hill, by the way, also in 1993. Let's call that uh, a coincidence, but it describes, as we all know, the gap between what the European Union was talked up to do or was expected to do versus the, the, the real um, things it can actually deliver. And I think we need to be careful here that we are not falling into that trap of this capabilities expectations gap. Um, it, it reminds me a bit of that uh, Belgian uh, surrealist painting, uh, Carol, clearly depicting a pipe, but saying ceci n'est pas un pipe. I think we risk doing the opposite, saying ceci est un health union, <laughs> um, but it is not, or, or it is not fully. Uh, and let me be clear, I do not blame the Commission. I think the health union proposals that we have seen from the Commission, EMA, ACDC, cross-border health threats, HERA, they are important steps in the right direction. And I also see, if I compare the work of the Commission now, to the Commission, for example, when we had the Mexican flu, it's a world of difference. Uh, the advanced uh, purchase agreements with um, several uh, vaccine producers, uh, what a difference that is compared to the Mexican flu when basically every member state was doing their own thing. And what you get then is that you bet on one or two horses, you bet on one or two vaccines, you don't bet on six or seven. So you. If we were still in that situation, we would have had less vaccines, less contracts, and maybe the rich member states doing okay, but the others kind of struggling to uh, ensure that they had uh, vaccines at all. Um, so um, it's not a criticism of the European Commission, but I do think that we now see the limits of this so-called hybrid model. We also saw that with the purchase agreements of the vaccines. If you have to wait for the slowest member state to give their approval to sign off 
a contract with a vaccine producer, you will always be late. Uh, and the hybrid model of the EU with you know, the Commission doing a part, but always hand in hand with member states, it has its limits. Um, I think the Commission also learned this lesson um, in a way uh, when I look, for example, um, at the whole issue of the uh, green certificates. So the recently agreed uh, COVID certificate where the Commission moved away from working with guidelines. Of course, the Commission has limited competences. They work with guidelines. But then they realize that with guidelines, member states, they often talk the talk, <laughs> but they don't walk the walk. So they agree in a council meeting to coordinate, for example, uh, the way, if necessary, we limit the freedom of movement, or they promise to coordinate closing and opening external borders. So for third country incoming flights, for example, but in the end, uh, they don't. And I think this is why the commission moved away from guidelines to working with legislation when it came to the COVID uh, certificate. And I think now we reach a very interesting point, and that is the summer holidays. I think we will manage to vaccinate 70% of Europeans um, by some point in the summer. Others will have recovered. Others will uh, be able to get a COVID certificate uh, because they recently had a PCR test. And all of our citizens are expecting that this means that they're, they regain their freedom. They can you know, go as they please, as they are used to in the European Union. And I fear that most likely that will not be the case. The European Parliament insisted that the general rule within the framework of the Green Pass should be that there are no additional limitations to the freedom of movement. Once you have a Green Pass, once you are, for example, vaccinated, why should you still be a subject to a quarantine arriving in uh, another member state or coming back? Um, I know that medically there are certain reasons for doing that when we have a new variant, etc. But in general, the uh, line should be that there should be no, um, no extra requirement once you have the green pass. Council clung to its competences and said, we don't, you know, we don't want to give this up. Um, and this can result in a situation where you have your green pass, but you still, you know, either, let's take France. Most Dutch people go on holiday in France. It could result in, in, in still having to quarantine in France or still having to take two weeks extra holiday uh, when you come back to the Netherlands in order to quarantine. And this basically shows the European citizens this capabilities expectations gap in practice, which will lead to either some of them lowering the expectations, which will lead to disappointment, which will not be good for support for the European Union, or many will demand that we step up and that we increase our capabilities. And this is where, in my view, the Conference on the Future of Europe can play a major role. I think citizens will demand action uh, in the field of uh, health and especially in crisis or pandemic situations. I'm not talking to about the normal scenario, but I think in pandemic or crisis times, and I'm afraid COVID will not have been the last one, citizens expect Europe to step up. And that means that the EU, we're only half there yet um, with this health union proposal. And um, it does mean that the EU needs to deal with some very inconvenient truth. Uh, let me mention a few. I think um, with the current GDPR, so the current data protection rules within the EU, the EU won't remain leading in state-of-the-art medicine or in the development of personalized medicine. That's one inconvenient truth. What do we want to do about it? The hybrid model that we have with member states and the EU working together, it doesn't work in a crisis. In crisis preparation, we still don't have the data that allows the European level to have a full picture, to put all the pieces of the puzzle together to see where the threat really comes from. And in crisis time, 
you need one center of command, not 27 member states and one European center of command. So this is all highly political, geopolitical, because it will determine our position in the world, our competitiveness. Um, and the alternative, I think it's clear, um, if we don't take this extra step, if we don't deal with these inconvenient truths that I think the citizens will demand that we deal with, then it will basically mean that the next pandemic, um, uh, unlike uh, uh, messenger RNA, which was a European, you know, invention very much, in the next pandemic, it will the, the solution will be developed in the US or in Asia. Uh, and every member state, if we don't take the next step, will still be uh, managing for itself. So um, in conclusion, let me maybe go back to the painting. Uh, I think it's time we uh, we moved away from halfway solutions. I call what we have now on the table a halfway solution. Move away from this surrealism where we think that if we call it a union, it is a union, um, to the hyper-realism. If you want a union, then don't only, only call it that way, but make it one. But then go all the way. And the experience tells us that um, this is very hard to do uh, from within the current institutional setup of the EU, but I do think that the Conference on the Future of Europe may provide us with the much more, the much needed impetus to actually uh, make sure that we uh, deal with some of these uh, inconvenient truths that are now not on the table, and at least, uh, Carol, and this is something that you called also for in your paper, at least, the Conference will make the debate more explicit than it has been until uh, now. At least that's what I uh, hope for, and that's uh, what my message will be also in the European Parliament. So, thank you very much. Very good. That's that's good. Very good. For a very convincing set of arguments, and I like your comparison moving from surrealism to realism, and we need to be realistic in this. Um, and above all, let's say we need to be credible towards our European citizens, and that's why we need to address it in the Conference for the Future of Europe. Very much agreed, and I think uh, Andrea will be happy to hear that. Uh, she will certainly have more work, or say probably unhappy, because she will have more work in the future. Suri, we move to you. Um, from an outsider's perspective, or I don't know where I place you, because you're in the middle of Europe, but you're uh, placed in a country which is not a member state of the EU. But anyway, we wanted to have you there to have a bit of a global perspective. Where does the EU fit globally? Okay, great. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to uh, share with you, I think, some of our um, data and our research looking very closely at the experience of COVID-19 vaccines. And in particular, what I thought might be useful for this uh, specific discussion is to see what do we learn about um, the, what are the implications from the experience of the last year for indeed a more uh, closer, a closer European health union from the vaccine experience. Uh, so if I could have the slides up, please. Um, great, thank you. And what I'm doing uh, in this presentation is actually comparing what Europe did uh, versus what the United States did, because of course you have a similar level of economic development, population size, et cetera, uh, versus any other part of the world. And I think there are indeed some interesting implications and lessons that come out of this experience. Uh, could I have the um, next slide? please. In particular, uh, what I'll be doing is showing you how the EU and its member states um, and the US uh, approached innovation as well as access to vaccines for COVID-19 in terms of how much money was put in, uh, when, and how. And we draw our conclusions based on data that is publicly available, but it also has significant limitations because we've had uh, quite little transparency on contracts. Uh, this is on both sides of the Atlantic. And of course, the situation is rapidly changing. Um, so what I've done up here on the slides is actually put up uh, uh, three pages where you can go and see a bit more if you want to dig into this data uh, further. You can look at uh, investments in research and development, access and manufacturing. And what I'll do in the next few minutes is uh, give you an overview of some of the findings that you see on this page. Next slide. So what you can see here, if you look at the top half of the uh, um, 
slide is the investment, uh, largely public, that was made up front into research and development. And the second half looks at uh, advanced purchase uh, agreements. But let me start with the first half. And what you can see is uh, that in terms of upfront investment, the largest amount of money the United States. Uh, Germany is not far behind, however, and once we look at money also coming from the European Union and uh, a handful of other member states, such as Spain, uh, the Netherlands, and France, you can see that altogether EU and the EU and its member states um, are close behind in second place in terms of upfront investments. Um, this order changes when we look at uh, advanced purchase agreements, which can be considered a form of incentive for innovation, because of course, if you're a company, you know you'll be selling uh, billions of uh, euros or dollars worth of products, then you're more likely to make that investment, and that investment uh, is significantly de-risked. And what you see is if we put APAs um, into the equation, and we only counted here um, uh, figures uh, for APAs that were concluded before the vaccines received uh, regulatory approval, so before it was clear whether they would be considered safe and effective, you see that Europe is now in first place, that Europe is the single largest uh, investor depending again on how you count um, R&D investment. And this is uh, almost about 25 billion. These, uh, this is in US dollars, but of course you can easily do, do the math. So indeed, the single largest purchaser. Next slide, please. What you can see here is how some of this money has flowed. So again, on the left-hand side, you see uh, the similar trends. The US uh, has invested directly in a number of companies. Uh, Germany, the EU, and other uh, member states did make some uh, investments directly in companies. You can see that flow going from the left to the right side of the diagram. But a number of European countries also uh, channeled money through SEPI. That's that middle purple bar. SEPI is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. It's a multilateral body that invests money in vaccines for uh, pathogens of pandemic potential. And SEPI is actually the third largest global investor in vaccine R&D. So you can see a, a quite different strategy, actually, um, a much more, uh, I would say, uh, diversified, but also strong support for multilateral solutions coming from Europe when we compare this to the US. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Let's see if we can get to the next slide. I think well, we're behind a bit. Um, <laughs> we'll reshare the presentation in a moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, what I wanted to show you, I, we'll get to the next slide in just a moment, um, on the next slide is simply that uh, indeed you can see visually that both the US and Europe uh, have largely sourced vaccines from the same companies, from the same suppliers, but uh, there is uh, far more money being spent in Europe, which makes sense because of course you have a much larger population. Um, but indeed, Europe remains in the single largest purchaser of vaccines. Um, if we can move to slide uh, six, uh, what you can see uh, in slide six, thank you, is that both the US and uh, Europe and its member states, um, the EU and its member states, excuse me, generally prefer to invest in their own companies. And this is perhaps not a huge surprise, but what you can see in the top bar, for example, all of those pink boxes are US companies. And so this is US money going largely to US companies with uh, a couple of small exceptions. Uh, if you look down at um, uh, the European Union, about the fourth row down, those are all uh, EU-based uh, companies. It looks a little bit more colorful, but they're all EU-based companies. And then similarly, when you look at Germany, a few more rows down, all investments in German companies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the difference here is when you look at SEPI, again, when you take a multilateral approach, you tend to have uh, a, a much more diverse portfolio of candidate technologies. And so you see, again, uh, remember that Europe has put significant amounts of money into SEPI. Um, this is one way in which you can diversify risk and, and um, develop many, many more vaccine candidates. Next slide, please. 
Shifting gears a little bit, and I'll come back to this in, in a moment, um, I wanted to just share with you a little bit of information now looking beyond Europe and looking beyond access in Europe. Uh, I wanted to share with you a little information on how Europe has approached vaccine diplomacy. And here we don't see too much yet. Uh, so we see that um, this is a slide showing you doses of vaccines that have been donated. Uh, and you can see China and India, um, all those different colors are representing different countries that have received relatively small volumes, but you can see very, very active, both countries very active in making um, at least uh, small volumes of vaccines available to a wide number of countries. The United States, not yet clear um, who will be receiving those vaccines, but a much larger in volume. Uh, and in contrast, when you look at Pacific European countries, uh, a few donations here and there, but again, relatively small and certainly much smaller than um, the three the three leads. There you can see Spain and Poland, for example. Um, next slide, please. So what are some of the conclusions we can draw from all of this data that I have just uh, thrown at you? So let's focus first on, on Europe and how Europe has approached vaccine innovation and access. Um, so as I've shown, Europe and its member states uh, are together the second largest upfront investors in R&D with the U.S. being first, um, but the world's largest purchasers of vaccines with the U.S. being second. However, when we look at the timing, and I didn't show you the slide with timing, you can see that on the website, um, we see that Europe moved more slowly. And it also took a less integrated approach than the U.S. in terms of its R&D investments. So in the U.S., uh, in Europe, excuse me, you don't have this even financial burden sharing across member states. It's quite, um, quite uneven and lumpy. Uh, but you also saw less integrated approach when we looked at how Europe approached linking of R&D subsidies or funding to production and procurement. And in contrast in the US, what you saw was very rapid public investment, uh, but in exchange for that R&D investment, the US government insisted on also ramping up production and getting first um, uh, first dibs, let's say, on any supply that would result. So it was a much more integrated approach. Uh, but across the two, uh, two regions, you do see indeed this preference uh, for investing at home. Uh, and, and part of the reason for uh, the U.S. moving faster is that it did have a, a pre-existing set of ins institutions, institutional arrangements to, in fact, invest rapidly in, uh, in pandemic um, uh, technologies called BARDA and DARPA. Anyway, there's a whole uh, universe of acronyms, but those institutions existed prior to COVID. And of course, that was not the case in Europe. Switching gears for a moment and looking uh, at, at Europe's place globally, as well as the US and, and uh, you know what's going on with vaccine nationalism and diplomacy, uh, both in Europe and in the US, you see many excess doses that have been secured uh, far in excess of um, what I would consider to be a fair proportion of global supply um, with the US with the EU at about 350% of this population, the US 200%, so far more than is needed. Uh, what we've seen from Europe is faster and larger scale financial and political support for multilateral cooperation, uh, whether that means political support for WHO, for CEPI, for COVAX, and of course, um, more uh, uh, a greater um, volume of exports being allowed out of uh, EU member states to supply the rest of the world. However, uh, Europe has been slower and certainly operating at a much smaller scale in terms of sharing these doses with the rest of the world, making donations, or in supporting uh, the debates for an intellectual property waiver at the World Trade Organization, which many developing countries have made quite clear is a high priority for them to be able to supply their own needs. Um, to conclude, I think one thing that, that I would say is that the proposal for uh, a HERA, that is sometimes called uh, the EU BARDA, right, a unified um, entity at EU level that would invest in uh, products like COVID-19 vaccines early on, I think would go a long way towards addressing that first set of issues under you know, the first set of bullet points, Europe, uh, vaccine innovation and access. And it would uh, better position Europe to be able to act boldly and quickly and to secure vaccine access for its own citizens. What I hope does not get forgotten is really the second set of uh, bullet points here, which is that um, in terms of Europe's place in the world, its support for multilateralism, uh, this has been a, a very important leadership role that it's played over the last um, uh, 18 months, and that I hope that this would continue, that HERA would not uh, lead to a turning inward, but that uh, 
a globally responsible role for Europe in both words and rhetoric, as well as in financial support in the wallet. And finally, action in terms of sharing of vaccine doses um, would be given equally high priority. Uh, with that, let me close. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suri. You touched upon a large, uh, many different issues which I would like to address, but um, I would also welcome the audience to raise questions. I see already a few questions on the chat box, but you can also raise questions on the Q&A box. Um, please do. There are certainly many issues which we can discuss. Um, I don't know where, say, where we start, but probably we can start with HERA and the need for HERA, which I, I think discussed with Andrea over the phone. But I mean, there are some people who say we have the agencies in Europe. Um, why do we need a new one? Let's say, can we not use the existing agencies and beef them up? Because we know, let's say, that creating agencies in Europe is, yeah, on the one hand, easy. On the other hand, before you have an agency in place operationally with the staffing, with the expertise, that takes years. And we know, an, I know an agency here on the the end of the street, which certainly Esther knows, um, the uh, SRB, Single Resolution Board which is under criticism that it hasn't done too much for the first five or six years of its existence. No, it exists since 2014. So I don't know who wants to take that question. I think Andrea prefers, let's say, not to take on that issue, but probably Esther or Suri want. Who starts? Who kicks it off? Let's say the question on HERA. Do we need a HERA? Is there a need for a HERA? Let's say, um, or could we do it through the existing bodies? Or, I mean, as you say, if, will HERA turn Europe more inward looking? Which I found an interesting. I mean, you're on mute, Esther. You're on mute. Yeah, yes. Now I'm good? Yes. Yeah. Sorry about that. And, and I think Suri already, uh, you know, uh, in a way answered it by saying, I hope HERA doesn't mean that uh, Europe is going to be more uh, inward looking. But, um, you know, we support the HERA proposal uh, as it came out of the Commission. But what I find much more interesting, um, especially after having heard now all three contributions, is the, mi uh, the, the mismatch between the approaches, so to say, and what that means for the future uh, approach um, in terms of, 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 of the approach at the global level. I mean, uh, after... Um, listening to the previous speaker, you could come to the conclusion that, you know, given the fact that R&D efforts are comparable between the US and Europe, basically the difference is in the first dose obligation that was put, the way I understand it, in the uh, US contracts and the Brits claim it's also in theirs. But of course, we haven't seen those contracts, so we don't know for sure. So it's this first dose element. And of course, the Defense Protection Act, which means that, you know, as long as the U.S. was building up uh, production of vaccines as well as material, nothing was leaving the country. If you then look at Europe, our argument is always, uh, yes, there were li little donations maybe from our side for the moment. But uh, over the past months, out of what we produced, Half was kept in Europe and half went all over the world. So we were kind of the pharmacy of the world, uh, whereas uh, in the US, everything was kept within the borders until you were in a position uh, to donate. So the question is, um, it, it's all nice and lovely that with Hera, we're kind of copy pasting uh, the um, uh, US approach. But um, there is, of course, a risk that in Europe, people are going to say, we also need the Defense Protection Act. We also need first dose obligations. Um, and, you know, that is basically because we see what the US did. So what is the way out of that? Is that in any case um, more of a, of a, and there are those countries, including mine, that say we need some kind of a worldwide pandemic treaty that kind of makes sure that, yes, we have multilateralism, uh, but we, we are also kind of following the same approach. Because my worry is, as long as we have these different approaches, and thank you very much for your presentation, because it sets the differences out very, very clearly. As long as between the developed world, we have all these differences, uh, we're not going to get to a very fair global approach. And so that would be my, my question to this moon, maybe. What's the lessons learned for the global level rather than just the European 
if I may babble, I'm now asking yeah, questions. No, that's, that's you know, okay. this, but, uh, you know, I for that, but if I, could, I, if, if I could add a question which has come in, let's say whether what we could learn, which is basically related to what you're concerned with, all three, from the capacity of the U.S. to decide centrally and to mobilize resources through executive orders by the president. If we compare this to Europe, before we have the funding available, yeah, and Esther knows that very well, it takes ages. Uh, whereas in the U.S., which is a federal state which has uh, whatever, the central budget about 20% of GDP or even more, Europe, it's 1% of GDP. We know it very well. So if you have to mobilize the resources, it can be done in a matter of a few weeks, even days in the US. And Europe, it takes, yeah, probably this year it has gone fairly fast, one year or so, but it takes uh, very long. Certainly, if you have to do it prospective, if there is no crisis. Suri? Yeah. I, I, I think the, these are accurate characterizations, but I think there's um, an important nuance to add here. So indeed, of course, the, the U.S. could act more quickly in a centralized way. It, it's not trying to coordinate 27 uh, sovereign states. But um, in a, in another important difference is the strategy of investing in research and development early on uh, for the entire country. This is what happened in the U.S. Whereas in Europe, we saw a relatively small amount of money coming from from Brussels, but most of the money came from Germany. And of course, Germany was not investing in R&D for the whole world or for the European Union. It was investing for, for Germany. Uh, I mean, that's normal, I think that's natural. And so the total amount of money uh, is large, which is to say, if we think about this as a Europe-wide expenditure, you can see it's not a question of how much money, it's a question of how do you channel that money and can you do it in a way that is unified and for the benefit of all? And do you get contributions, of course, from all member states to pay for that rather than having a few member states paying uh, you know, paying the lion's share, which is what we saw with, with COVID. And I think you can only make that happen with, of course, structured agreements um, through something like, like a HERA. What, it, you know, in contrast, what we saw in Europe is a much heavier reliance on buying at the end of the day and in fact spending quite I mean enormous sums 25 billion so far uh, roughly um, is our estimate uh, enormous sums a tenfold the amount of R&D money um, but at that point you don't have nearly as much control over the innovation process. If you want to be able to control and steer that process for the public interest, you've got to jump in. I mean, the public sector has to jump in early with a lot of money and take on that risk that um, industry is not, not well placed to take on, certainly in the early weeks of an epidemic. And what's quite interesting to note is that it was in January of 2020, in January of 2020, that uh, both the US and CEPI made their initial investments in vaccine R&D. And this is how quickly you have to be able to move before there was even, for example, a, a public health declaration, uh, sorry, an, an international emergency declaration. Over. Thank you. And to answer your question, Carol, I mean, this is, of course, uh, linked to the budget and how quickly you can have the resources in order to proceed with that kind of speed. And we all know that having to agree on a budget that is basically set in stone for seven years ahead is, is not making the EU very well placed in order to have that speed. Uh, I mean, I would already um, be relatively happy if we could fix within that general budget the, um, the following issue, and that is the fact that, um, for example, our research, our horizon funds, right? Uh, all our uh, research money that is in different programs once you put something like HERA on the table, once you put something like the wish to research more, but also to produce more uh, within the EU, once you put that on the table, uh, you can only conclude that the existing uh, spending framework, that whether it's Horizon or something else, is not in sync with that wish. And, you know, our biggest expert in the EPP group is Dr. Christian Eder. You, you can, you know, approach him at any moment of the day and he will tell you in what program is what kind of money. And even he says there is no consistency between the new wishes that we have as a result of COVID and the old already pre-agreed research and development framework. So we need to fix that problem first, that is within the agreed budget. And then, of course, there is the much, much bigger question that we are not going to resolve that easily, which is to say, 
maybe the European budgets should function in a different way. Um, maybe there should be somewhere some reserves of drawing capacity that you could draw on um, in a time of crisis. Um, I mean, we used to have that 15 years ago for veterinary crises. Isn't it weird that we don't have that for human crises? And the reason we had that for veterinary crises, by the way, was because the budget was a bit more, the jacket was a bit larger, so there were some room, some reserves. Now it's so tight that we don't have these kind of reserves. So whenever you want to kind of refocus in one direction or another, you automatically enter into this straight jacket, which is the seven-year European budget. But uh, you, you might do an entire week of um, in-depth sessions about that. Uh, yeah. I will add another uh, uh, moment because that, that uh, topic is bigger than just us today. Thank you for reminding us to this example of the veterinary crisis. Indeed, I had forgotten about this, but we certainly mobilized uh, much more uh, resources, much more rapidly. I thought, let's say, I could pass back to Andrea, just asking about her views about this kind of, I mean, balance between the center and between the member states, meaning between the EU and the member states, and how to find it, and how you see this uh, from your perspective. Also, if I remember correctly, one of the problems in um, ECDC is a bit the governance, but I don't think the governance has been fundamentally changed in the regulation, if I remember correctly. So don't you need to have stronger decision capacity at, at ECDC in case of crisis? Well, I think that comes to the to the point that I mentioned. Uh, um, uh, how far is um, uh, is it possible that the current um, distribution of competences in in health can be shifted, uh, at least uh, during times of crisis? Uh, because um, uh, I mean, uh, as you have have uh, all said, of course, it takes longer to get an agreement the more partners you have uh, 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 around the table. Um, the um, so so that is something that cannot be done in a crisis. It has to be agreed upon before. Uh, there is one thing that makes it, uh, of course, not black and white, and that is the fact that there are, of course, uh, issues and decisions that need to be taken knowing the local context. Um, so there is no way that all the decisions that are necessary in such a crisis uh, in all the countries can be taken at the EU level. So we have to carefully really examine what is it that uh, would benefit from uh, a, a uniform implementation during a crisis uh, and then see whether there is consensus that this is uh, um, uh, 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 such decisions are taken on the at the EU level i mean just for for, for example in our in our field we have early on uh, uh, made very clear protocols um, how to roll out the testing in the countries whom do put up population-based surveillance to get representative uh, figures. But in the end, it was the decision of each country what kind of uh, testing strategy they implemented. And of course, if you would just test people going into a hospital versus to do population-based uh, surveillance, you get completely different figures. And that is something that uh, accompanied us uh, uh, throughout the whole the whole. Uh, uh, past one and a half years. So that's only one example where it would have been easier in the end for everybody, you know, when, when then making the comparisons to have a, 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 a consensus about how to, to approach that. I have an additional question because um, Esther raised that point about GDPR and about the incompatibility between GDPR and health data, meaning there's a question also about this, somebody who says, let's say, can, I mean, what is your opinion about data collection and then at the same time privacy in the domain of health? You must be confronted with this problem on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, th indeed we are. And there is, of course, um, always this um, 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 tension. Um, because, of course, uh, this is not just getting data because it's nice to have. It's for a certain purpose. It's for, it's for a... a uh, 
well, I would say a higher, a higher good. Uh, that's the po uh, the protection of the population. So this is why uh, uh, all the countries have also nationally laws uh, for infectious diseases that relinquish some of the of the um, uh, individual uh, consent also to the use of the data. Uh, for instance, that a physician that normally does is not allowed to tell uh, somebody else, the authorities, about a patient has to, uh, 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 by, based on the law, has to inform because of this uh, uh, public health uh, uh, value so and I think in that sense uh, uh, that has to be has to be approached of course this uh, um, uh, question gets even more um, uh, urgent when we are looking at um, uh, digitalized uh, data collection uh, from uh, electronic health records so here I think a very careful balance between the the, the uh, right of the individual and the need of the population have to be have to be uh, done up front thank you andrea for these uh, extensive uh, answers question probably i will turn back to suri and to um, esther about I mean, the balance then between Europe and then the rest of the world. I mean, sure, you said, let's say Europe is exporting. I think Esther referred to that as well. We export vaccines. But can we find a balance between satisfying, basically, we have seen this debate over the last months, local population as compared to, I mean, helping globally. And we've seen, I mean, the first country which blocked uh, exports was Italy under Draghi, which I think was quite memorable. Can we find a balance between these two? And in a democratic system, can you allow this to happen if your own population has not been sufficiently helped yet? Who takes that on? Suri, you start. Mm -hmm. I think we have to. I, mean, I think we have to, and I'm, I'm very keen to um, hear uh, Esther's views on this, for, certainly. Um, I, I think it's very difficult, of course, uh, in a situation of scarcity for any political leader to be exporting vaccines when your own people don't have enough. I think that's a very, very difficult situation, which is why we need to agree on rules, both Europe-wide, but globally. I think you know, Esther mentioned the pandemic treaty discussions. Um, this is an opportunity to agree on rules globally that would ensure that this happens because we know that in the heat of the moment, uh, it takes a probably an unrealistic amount of political courage to in fact, um, Send resources outside your own borders when your own voters are uh, are, are um, going without. I, I think that's not a realistic situation. So how do we prevent this in the future? I mean, uh, we can get into the nitty gritty of ramping up production capacity around the world, and you know, dealing with intellectual property barriers and funding for R and D. All of these things uh, need to be addressed at global level as well as at European level. But I do think the time to make those agreements is now. Uh, rather than letting this short window of political opportunity we have to make those agreements slip out of our hands. And, and that's something I'm, I'm quite um, concerned will happen if we don't move quickly on, on pandemic treaty discussions and uh, establishment of institutions like uh, HERA. Okay, thank you. Esther, this is your politician. So uh, how do you look at this? I mean, you have the pressure from your local electorate, but what if, yeah, we have to help Africa? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, in the chat there, Hannes Svoboda, uh, you know, uh, pretty much sums up what any of my constituents would tell me. Uh, he writes, only if Europe can satisfy the need of its people, it can help globally, which is, of course, also necessary. And, uh, you know, there, I think, um, um, there is some dissatisfaction in the European Union that we saw these huge amounts of exports Whereas, you know, uh, the newly elected um, uh, American president, who we all thought was, you know, a multilateral kind of guy uh, after the, his predecessor, uh, pretty much continued the, the, the Trump line, which is to say, I close the borders and first of all, I deal with my own population. So the fact that the limited number of exports uh, going out of the uh, US, I think it was even a loan that went to Canada, it was not even a gift it, it had to be returned you know the first things that went across the border from the us 
Canada was delivered by the EU, not by the US. And this uh, created a lot of surprise in the in the EU, uh, you know, especially from um, that kind of an administration who Europeans thought might have been a bit more uh, multilateral. But on the other hand, many of my constituents fully understood that you say first I deal with my own people and then I deal with the rest of the world. So this is why I'm so much in favor of this pandemic treaty, which hopefully will allow us to kind of. Uh, have some kind of processes or channels in place to make sure that we can kind of do both and start with the second a bit earlier while still working on the first issue and still reassuring our citizens that we also have enough uh, for them. Um, but, uh, you know, overall, uh, I think the uh, latest initiative of the European Commission that says we should also invest in production hubs in Africa, in those countries that have the potential to contribute to uh, production and infrastructure, we should help. I think it's not only export, but also set up production elsewhere in the world. And maybe we need a bit more fine tuning, because let's be honest, I mean, we are, we pride ourselves on the fact that we exported as much as we kept for our own use. On the other hand, some of those experts were going to uh, countries that were basically not about vaccinating their own people. They were about setting up vaccine tourism, whether that's in the Gulf or elsewhere in the world. The question is, you know, do you really need to facilitate that? Or do you go into fine tuning saying, you know, country X in the Gulf has enough to vaccinate its own people by now? Let's have a chat about where these vaccines should really go, uh, you know, with priority. We're not going to uh, facilitate the vaccine tourism in expensive golf resorts uh, uh, for those who can afford it. There's a huge social component, but it takes a bit of, you know, fine tuning and, and some, some brave decisions in order to go there. But we need to have these discussions, I think. Yeah, thank you, Esther. Indeed, that's a difficult balancing act in between finding the balance between the two. But we are a net enormous exporter of pharmaceutical products, European Union. We may have American companies, as we all know, based in the EU, but which are producing here also to export. And of course, that translates in our export figures. I think pharmaceuticals have overtaken manufacturing, meaning cars, etc., in total exports since 2019. Um, Andrea, I come back to you. Uh, pandemic treaty, you must have views on that because that's related to your core competence. Yeah, I mean, we haven't um, been involved very much so far in this um, uh, uh, as, as um, we basically will not have any... any um, um, uh, well, uh, any role in, in bringing this about. But as I said in my, in my intervention, uh, uh, we, we have clearly seen that for some issues there are, uh, we need to have global solutions um, because uh, with all the goodwill um, uh, that was uh, beforehand uh, in, in, in the last year, we have now seen how, how it works out that still uh, the vaccine distribution is not e e evenly uh, over, over the world. Um, so, so the, some some other ways have to be found. Whether the pandemic treaty is one way to do this, uh, then we should pursue this. Um, uh, whether there are others like uh, establishing production uh, uh, sites in in different parts of the world, then we should produ uh, pursue that one. And probably it's a combination of those. If I speak about global issues, if I could turn to Suri, sometimes what strikes me is that. What is the EU's representation in the WHO? Should we have a stronger EU direct representation in the WHO, meaning to coordinate everything? Of course, there is raises right away the question, the EU has limited competence in health. But if you look back over the last year, I think there were certainly a lot of coordination failures at international level, which, by the way, have not been addressed a lot over the last months yet and should be addressed. Indeed, I, I do think that the um, the EU as a regional body really did step up uh, at the World Health Organization one year ago when um, we had 
you know, if we think back to last May, we had a complete breakdown of international cooperation, borders closing everywhere, trade restrictions, movement restrictions, WHO being very actively attacked uh, by, uh, you know, former President Trump and, and others. Um, and I do think that the it, it wasn't only individual European member states, it was really the EU that led the, um, I think, the rescue of international cooperation in many ways one year ago. And, and I, I don't think this is an exaggeration to say so. And this is why I believe the um, support for multilateralism that we hear strongly defended from Brussels is a very important political uh, message um, that Europe brings to the world in a way, and that we, we need that. We need more of that in, in Geneva. Um, where, where I think things really began to fall apart was uh, once once we moved past the political moment, the implementation, and this is why I emphasize, you know, wallets and action uh, beyond just words. Um, I think that's where things really did begin to to fall apart, and why it's why. Uh, indeed, we we need to put in place the arrangements, whether for vaccines or for you know a, a thousand other health issues. We have to put in the arrangements that satisfy the needs of EU member states. Of course, I, I fully agree with um, uh, with the comments that that any international agreement has to meet the national needs of member states, but it also has to meet global needs. And we have to see these as not uh, intention with the, in, in tension, meaning you know, not in competition with each other. We have to find solutions that do work for everyone. And this is why I think some of the debates around the intellectual property waiver are very interesting because in some ways it's actually easier to share knowledge. It's easier to share data and intellectual property than it is to share doses of vaccines if you don't have enough. It's easier to say, we will allow and facilitate many, many more people to make the same product uh, because that means our voters do not go without. We can meet the needs of our own voters, but we also don't block other countries from meeting the needs of their voters and their people. These are the kinds of solutions that I think, you know, what everyone might think about the IP waiver, it's the idea of finding solutions that will meet the needs of both domestic populations. I mean, all politicians have to answer to, you know, your own constituents, uh, as well as the, you know, the, the broader global needs. And and we know, I mean, uh, uh, Andrea Iman began this session really reminding us of the fact that, that um, at the end of the day, protecting global health and protecting, you know, stopping this pandemic outside EU borders is in the interest of the EU member states. It's in the self-interest from a health perspective, from an economic perspective, from a political perspective. All of that is in the self-interest of the EU member states, but we have to persuade citizens that that's the case. Yeah, very good argument. Um, we have two minutes left, probably I turn probably clockwise back to Esther and then to Andrea. Esther, any comment on the global representation of the EU? I mean, on the role for the EU at the WHO before I turn to Andrea, which was- well, I don't want to take up the issue of the patent waiver. I think I should because that's the big elephant. Uh, oh, in you can the do, yeah. the, yeah. the, yeah. the, the, uh, the elephant had on. I would agree with Suri that it cannot be business as usual. Business as usual being, you know, we are not willing to discuss uh, anything that uh, comes near solving this issue of patent and knowledge, etc. Um, but on the other hand, you immediately also mentioned the knowledge. It's easier to share knowledge in some cases than it is to share the vaccines itself. And I really think just waiving a patent will not give you the shared knowledge in order to produce for yourself. So there are other less, less you know, um, head on <laughs> or less politicized issues that might get us to a solution quicker. You know, there's the option of pooling patents. Um, there's all these options that I think will get us get vaccines into arms where we need them in arms. That's in Africa, that's in Asia, that's in Latin America, etc. Quicker than just kind of the paper victory that some would get if we wait these patents, because by just waiting the patents, you don't have the knowledge yet. So, Carol, I, I, I belong to those in the parliament, um, and this is a hot debate. Uh, so there's differences depending on which political group you ask. Uh, but I belong to those who say, uh, I think we should leave the black and white discussion about waiving patents, yes or no, 
because even if the answer is yes, okay, then the patent is waived, but we don't have the knowledge shared yet in order to really ramp up production and get these vaccines into arms. So I want to find a third way solution there um, that will hopefully get us uh, to, to getting these vaccines into arms also in other places in, in the world quicker than this black and white solution that this debate is currently a bit limited to. So I'm much more in favor of exploring these third way it, uh, options, which could include uh, a combination of sharing data and knowledge, but also pooling patents, for example. So I think that this is going to be what we're going to be doing in the months ahead. So never a dull moment. I mean, your colleague from the Parliament, Hannes Svoboda, was saying, look, we need to force companies to produce more and pay for it. And um, If yeah. you force me to do anything, I'm less inclined to share. So I think really <laughs> the solution lies somewhere in the middle uh, between business as usual, which is nothing happens, and this discussion that is now put very high on the agenda, of course, by President Biden to say uh, the solution lies in waiving this patent. I think there's options in between that might get us to a result even quicker. Thanks, Esther. Any final comment, Andrea, from your side? Yeah, I mean, our global cooperation is a bit more on a practical level. Uh, so we have uh, really close contacts with the US CDC, the Africa CDC, the China CDC and with WHO also to align more on the practical side of advice. Uh, because also here, a uh, different, slight difference in uh, internationally in, in um, uh, uh, guidance documents uh, create uh, uh, tremendous difficulties for for, for people that want to cross borders uh, um, and for for the member states to to justify why they uh, want to do it uh, this way or the uh, the other way, whether they uh, uh, why they don't follow WHO, why they follow ECDC, or why they follow e uh, um, uh, uh, WHO and not ECDC. I mean, these are the these are the kind of distress that we that we try to eliminate uh, by um, uh, you know engaging in the discussions with the colleagues around the uh, are around the world and already only that if you speak about staffing like we did in the beginning if you have to do this you need already i mean an international department in the ecdc to follow yeah. this and as you were saying i mean these as everybody knows by now viruses don't stop at the borders you yeah. need to have a very strong cooperation and of course there's a lot of discussion about how you do this so uh, with this i mean we're just a bit over time i would like to thank uh, the different speakers for their participation andrea Thanks a lot. Also, I mean, if I look back, you must have got in a very stressful year. So thanks for joining us uh, today. And uh, hopefully we can, can invite you again. Also, Esther, I hope you will get, uh, take a good position on these regulations at the European Parliament. And if you need help, let us know, let's say, because I found it extremely important. For those who haven't looked at this, the regulations are many, each of them 70 pages long or so. So quite some work for the Parliament to go through each of these pieces. And Suri, thanks a lot for joining us and giving this global dimension. I would like to look more in your data to see how you compiled it because it looks a bit uh, complex for me to understand that Germany is the biggest spender and then we have the EU as well. I just have to try to square that circle. I cannot fully square it yet, but I think that was a very interesting discussion. Uh, thanks for joining us again. And um, for those which are listening, we start again with the follow-up sessions at 3.30. So, um, but that's discussing other teams. This was the main uh, highlight of uh, highlight session of today the spotlight which was about the health union so thanks a lot for joining us and i hope you enjoyed it thank you bye-bye bye-bye you have to click on leave at the top